Yeah, this, uh, so this uh, you can learn a lot. All right. I want to ask you more questions about that. Hello. Hello. Hey, all. Thanks for coming. Uh, and and thank you in particular for showing up given the last minute changes in scheduling. It's great to see you. So uh, I was down in Buenos Aires trying to figure out South America and marketplaces, and I, and I met Daniel. And uh, he didn't just explain to me Buenos Aires and Argentina. He explained to me a lot of his thinking about how e-commerce works and their lessons learned, uh, the mistakes they've made, the uh, what they've learned from it. And I found it fascinating. And so I asked him to come visit us next time he was in the US, and he gratefully agreed. And he's here. Uh, it's going to be a talk that takes probably about half the hour. Uh, then there are going to be questions. Normally after these, we mill around and ask more questions. He is unfortunately leaving straight from here to the airport. So ask your questions. Don't wait until the end. All right. Without further ado, Daniel. Thank you, Kelly. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Danny. Uh, I'm CTO at Mercado Libre. Please, I, let's make this interactive. I, this is a half an hour introduction, but if you feel like you want to ask a question, please interrupt me. Uh, I don't know if you know us, uh, just a minute on, uh, on who we are. Uh, it's a little cut out. So Mercado Libre is the, the largest e-commerce platform in, in Latin America, uh, and one of the top 10 in the world. We are present in 13 countries. We lead in each one of them. We're number one in each one of them. Uh, we're a public company. We're listed here in the NASDAQ. We IPO'd in 2007, I guess, 3.5 billion in, in market cap. Uh, so we're a marketplace. So we don't own inventories. Uh, we connect buyers and sellers just as Etsy does. Uh, roughly, we had last year, just to give you an idea, 5 million sellers and 14 million buyers that together generated something like uh, 53 million units uh, sold and roughly uh, 5 billion in uh, gross merchandise volume. That makes something like 100 bucks an average transaction. So we, are, we have offices all throughout Latin America. We are more than 1,600 employees. We started the company in 1999, and we got uh, maybe a, a bit larger than we, we expected uh, 11 years ago. So that's the introduction. The, the things I wanted to share with you today uh, are maybe four large challenges or milestones that we've experienced and focusing on the things that we've done maybe wrong or the mistakes we made and how we corrected them. Because I hate when I go to a talk and they, they say we're geniuses, we figured out all from the beginning. It was not like that. We made a lot of mistakes. So the first one uh, is about complexity, how to deal with product when Complexity takes over, and it's not just a problem of web design. So let me give you some examples. Details are, are, are not important. The, the, problem, the, the important stuff is the proportion and the orders of magnitude. The, the, ones, the, the one in the left is the previous sell your item form, and the one in the right is the current sell, sell your item form. Sell your item means that uh, when you want to list an item for the first time in the website, we put through this form before or this form afterwards. Uh, can you guess the dropout rates of the left one? 30%. 30% drop rates. Co completion rate or dropout rates? <laughs> it was 75% dropout rates. So th that means uh, out of four poor guys trying to list an item or a platform, three will not complete the task. Can you guess the completion time Order. on average? Five seconds. <laughs> Order, it's, a, it's measured in minutes, tens of minutes, hours. Uh, the, the average completion time was 35 minutes, uh, it, average. Uh, so it was painful. But the, the, the important lesson here, uh, in my view, is how we got there. We can not let, uh, it's not easy to read the title, but we've been adding and adding functionalities for years. Every single checkbox that we added there made perfect sense. 
But one day, we got up and saw that, that the complete product uh, was not a product, was a large compilation of features. In a marketplace, wherever, whatever you need to do, you have to add a checkbox in, in your listing form, because everything is created in, in this form. So we were really good in adding stuff, but add, adding stuff. Uh, but the minute we tried to subtract things, then the war began. For some organizational dynamic, it's very easy. I have to add something. I mean, maybe I'm a manager and say, I want to add this. Maybe no one will complain, because the next week, you will have to add something, and I won't complain. The problem is that the user is not seated at this negotiation table. The user is not saying, you know, hey, I don't want a form like this. Last thing about these forms is that uh, when you add everything that comes through your mind, you're skipping the task of deciding what is truly essential by implication. So we have to decide. Uh, we had auctions, we had fixed price, we have optional feature fees. We had to decide what to keep and what to discard. There was a war, and uh, there was a, we have a guest speaker now. <laughs> uh, uh, there was no consensus there. We, we, we had to apply force. For example, uh, we got rid of auctions for newbie uh, sellers. Auctions are complicated. You have to issue a base price, a reserve price. It's not easy to explain a reserve price for a newbie user. So the first lesson, lesson uh, we wanted to share is that subtracting is much more difficult than adding. And uh, this has to be solved in a deeply and complex organizational dynamics when you have to subtract things, because you will hurt eventually revenue streams as well. This was the single best thing we do we've done uh, to help the acceleration of the new sellers on the platform. So I have this slide uh, on my desk for, for almost a year. Uh, I challenge each and every one of you to look at the screen, a critical flow in your websites, and trying to figure out if everything that is there is there because of really users are using every pixel on this page, or these things are a result or a consequence of some organizational dynamics or some revenue stream that we needed to add at some point in time, and no one challenged this checkbox anymore. So this is, remember, all in, in the complexity part, how to solve complexity. Here's another example. At some point in time, someone thought, you know, we could charge a small fee, a small upfront fee to sellers to highlight uh, their listings in the search result page. That was a great idea, an upfront payment directly to the bottom line. It actually worked very well, so we came up with other uh, features like, for example, the background and the border, and we sold the bold, uh, titled bold. So we end up with a listing like this on the left. I think w you all agree that as a buyer, you don't want to see listings like this. You want a clean search result. You want to focus on your items. The problem is how to solve this. This used to be green and yellow, but then w we asked uh, some web designer, please fix this usability problem. And uh, I think you would agree with me that there is no possible way of solving a usability problem if you're selling exposure, visual cues. They're just impossible. So we needed to uh, come up with this one. And at a certain point, we needed to give up revenues somehow. And the interesting lesson I think we wanted to share is that you have to decide strategically what is best for you, because there is no A-B testing that could be done to justify such a, a change. If the data junkies tell you, you know, prove me that you can eliminate this and, and, and make a revenue neutral change, it's not going to be possible. You have to hurt revenues maybe in the short term. You have to give up revenues. So A-B testing for problems like this, I, I found it really useless. 
it's impossible to measure long-term churn, uh, which is the feeling that the buyers are experiencing when, when dealing with this product. Uh, the competitive edge that you're giving up by having a polluted website. Those metrics are very hard to, to, to measure. I'm not saying that A-B testing is the wrong thing. Uh, I'm just saying that for this dramatic and core changes, uh, they are not. Last one, very quickly, of these examples. We used to charge for pictures in listing pages. So if a seller paid a small fee, we showed this little picture in the search results. And by implication, we're not showing every single picture who didn't pay the fee. So as a result, you see <laughs> search results without pictures. And I, I want you to think for five seconds. We're a marketplace trying to drive sales. And for some reason, we got sidetracked. We used the, the revenue as a, the short-term revenue, I would say, as a guiding principle of our user experience. That was, those are actual screenshots of our own website. So those mistakes we made, not somebody else. And I was there. I'm not blaming someone else. I'm just sharing our own experience. Again, it will not compensate uh, the, the corrected versions the first day or maybe the first month, but long term is the right way to go. And I will encourage to remember things when uh, I, I think you all work in engineering or product, there will be a moment and you have to make this strategic decision between short term revenues or a good design product. Keep in mind that uh, those are tough decisions. I also have this uh, image to remember. They used to hunt monkeys like this. Uh, monkeys just didn't realize that they had to let go the banana to get their hand out. It's a very, I felt like this. So maybe if you have to remember something, you will remember the monkey more than the, the search result. So as, a, so as a closure for this first part, uh, I chose some, example that, some examples, sorry, that at the core, of those examples, in order to really fix the user experience, you have to understand deeply the pricing model, the business model, and the complete interaction of all of them in order to really solve some usability problems. Those are much harder, I would say, than uh, making a single page prettier. Uh, well, Etsy has a beautiful site, uh, and uh, maybe we don't, so uh, maybe it's not that easy. Uh, but uh, things like this are, are, are tough. And as a product managers, or even as engineers trying to develop a good product, you have to understand the whole model and the implications of, of each one of the parts. I hope these examples uh, are useful to you. So then the, I, I made up this chronology, but it w I'm oversimplifying. But after solving these uh, product chain challenges, uh, we faced the next problem. We created and architected our own website in the early 2000s. There were no APIs then. And then the, the way you used to build systems back in the 2000s were, there was a, the, the classical stack, stack using appliances. You tend to build monolithic systems. They were well-structured, maybe logically, but they were still just one code base, conceptually one database, conceptually one team. Uh, and we reached the point in which this did not make sense anymore. It was slowing us down. So we spent, two years ago, we spent more than a year rewriting our entire software. I mean, everything that was there, we led that in survival mode and started over from scratch. Very different technology. Uh, and I wanted to share this process with you now. So first, we built a common API. This API will be the, and is right now, the, the common layer for every single possible development. APIs should not be a back door. I, you know, many companies that have their own systems and their APIs become trendy and they, they open this new front end uh, as an API. Uh, 
I think that's probably not the best way of handling this situation because you will run into s certain problems if you do that. Maybe it's okay for you. In our case, strategically was not the right thing to do. So we rewrote our entire business logic here. Then we rewrote all the web properties on top of the same API. Then built our mobile applications on, on top of the same layer. Desktop application, desktop tools for sellers, for example, and so forth. Uh, and the back office, which is really important for a marketplace like, like ours. For example, we're, we're implementing Salesforce.com right now. And Salesforce, the, the Salesforce team uh, are using the, is using the same common layer of APIs. So it's first the APIs and then the functionality and, and not the other way around. And of course, third parties. Third parties for a community like, like, like we are, are very important. They, they are very creative. They develop new ways of, uh, of showing. Uh, they, they, live, they develop new front ends and new ways of, of integrating. I'll show you later. But this is uh, our common simplified co conceptual principle. Another interesting principle that we have applied, and I can say right now that it's successfully well applied, is the hard and extreme decoupling of our team. So we inspired this model by observing all the new startups that we're creating every day and how they interact with each other. So it's very common now to, to see a small startup with, I don't know, five or six guys that interact perfectly with a different startup, five or six guys. They have a symbiotic application. They have their own infrastructure, their own team, their own source code, their own data, maybe hosted in Amazon Web Service or Rackspace, and they're working perfectly. So the question was, why can't we do the same internally? Why the users company uh, cannot talk the orders company the same way that they are talking to Facebook or Twitter? The APIs are the same, the authentication mechanisms are pretty much the same. So there was no reason. So we did exactly that. We used OpenStack. Are you familiar with OpenStack? What? It's a, we created a, like a hybrid cloud internally. So uh, you can create instances outside using, for example, Rackspace or internally using our own cloud, but it's using the same technology. So you create your own virtual hardware. You develop in the language you want, maybe because you're trying to solve a particular problem. You, you're, not, you're not stuck with the, the company language. Uh, and you start this little enterprise, search, orders, listings, API, and so forth. Uh, and you're just a cell within the organization. The API layer has very strict rules about how the communication works between those enterprises. This is probably common knowledge to you. But the interesting stuff is they work as a common and small company. And when you think about processes, startups don't focus that much on processes. I started listening to the word processes when you grow large. So the process junkies take over in a large organization. This is a problem. Uh, there are good processes. I, I love maybe Scrum or XP or whatever. If the process helps just to build better applications, that's fine. But all the processes that are there to control a large number of developers or engineers, maybe in multiple locations, are very dangerous. They, they, they're not supposed to be there. They're there because we're architecting our team the wrong way. That's a personal opinion, but it's an opinion. Um, and of course, the, the ownership changes. They push code into production whenever they want. There's no maiden trunk. There's no such a thing as you have to push the code into the branch and see what happened in the integration tests. And uh, if the guy that was just before me screwed thing up, things up, I have to wait. Nothing like this. Uh, you go at your own pace. We went from uh, major releases, a uh, couple major releases a week, to many releases a day. Uh, and it's, the, the pace of innovation is still increasing. And it's very easy for us right now to start a team someone, somewhere sorry, in, in the world 
that's it. We use GitHub. We use our own cloud. Uh, this has been uh, a great success as compared to our previous tightly coupled and monolithic application. Uh, maybe in the Q&A we can discuss it. Maybe you have a different experience. Uh, well, for third parties, uh, you all know this. Uh, once you release a, a good API, and, and it's a good API if you're using this API. So anyone, technically, right now, can build Mercado Libre. Because we are using the exact same APIs that we are sharing with the world. The exact same. It's not like similar one. Physically, it's the same one. So <laughs> when, you, when you're creating an API, a service that you're not using yourself, maybe the quality is not the same one. So we created this, and third parties just started to appear, building a new front end. So someone created like a Pinterest-like front end for our platform, uh, and we have this affiliate program. Are you familiar with affiliate programs? So it's like a revenue sharing. So it's a nice combination. So they can offer different and new ways of browsing our site. They get a piece of that. It's interesting. And also back-end integrations. So this one is an e-builder similar in the US uh, to Channel Advisor or, or this type of software. Uh, if you have many channels or maybe your own storefront, by integrating with the APIs, you can list all the inventory into a new channel very, very quickly. So this is... Uh, what we've done to unlock innovation, uh, we came to a point in which we realized that we were strategically dead. Because we, were, we grew large, and our ability to execute faster, maybe in, in mobile devices or any other screens, what's tough? Right now, we can take the phone and say, you know, we need a, an application for Samsung TV or whatever. Uh, it's a, it was a an interesting change of, uh, of mindset to us. So the first, so the third, sorry, uh, challenge or uh, milestone that I wanted to share with you today uh, is the problem that we were still working on a single channel. So we made our product a little prettier, maybe more simple uh, or simpler. We had APIs, we were executing much faster, but no mobile phones until a year ago. We were really, really late. Um, maybe the, the upside of being late is that you can leapfrog. I'm a positive person. I like to find it. But you can leapfrog uh, when you're late. You can learn from others. If you're still alive, if you're still in the ring, you can leapfrog. I will skip this. Uh, you all know the stats. Mobile is huge. Uh, so. You cannot read the title, but it says that uh, HTML5 uh, is the future, but not the present. Uh, so roughly a year ago, we were trying to evaluate whether to go into the, the, this right once, run anywhere paradigm, or to build specific software for every single platform out there. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Okay. It's a tough question because, I mean, I used to be an engineer for many years, so it's embedded. It's in, in your DNA. You should reuse stuff. How different could it be? Who is going to maintain five, seven platforms? Many dimensions, many platforms, many verticals, many, it's just too much. The thing is, uh, I personally think that the HTML5 experience right now is much, much worse than all things equal that their native counterparts. And uh, you can do that. Maybe your users will tolerate that, but you're leaving maybe a competitive edge for someone else to do it better. So for example, this is our couple of screenshots of our native API, uh, sorry, native uh, mobile application on, on iOS. Uh, it's no scrolling, all the buttons. I mean, the, I, you can have your own uh, idea of how to design a native application, but uh, we're happy that we resisted the, tem the temptation, the engineering temptation of, uh, of writing stuff 
of writing a mediocre application once and run this mediocre application everywhere. So uh, our approach was to develop in-house the iOS and Android versions and uh, do this third parties plus revenue sharing with some cherry-picked partners to develop other platforms like BlackBerry, Symbian, or, or, or Windows 8. Uh, so I, I was giving a talk a, a couple months ago and someone said, you know, maybe you're, you have money and that's why you can develop, you can hire developers for, from every single platform out there. Uh, so I develop on HTML5 because I'm a startup, I'm a small, and I cannot afford to develop in every platform. And I say to this guy, uh, you're right that maybe you cannot afford this today, uh, but if I were you, I will develop in only one application. Maybe the greatest success last year, of the last maybe couple years, is Instagram that was available in only one platform. So the, it was sold by maybe a billion dollars or a bit less right now. Uh, but it was sold for, for, a, for an incredible amount of money and they took over the, the photo sharing space by being available in only one platform. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, uh, again, I think that uh, being really strong and delivering a great experience, if you had to choose, I prefer a, a great experience in one platform and, no, and not a mediocre experience among many platforms. That's just an opinion. Uh, just an example of this uh, HTML5 versus these packages that uh, there are many of there. You, you, can, uh, you can write the applications that they will generate the code for many native ones. Uh, just as an example, the, the back button. Almost every application needs to go back to a previous state at some point in time. So if you're running iOS, uh, maybe the right way is uh, the, the standard user interface way in iOS is to have this row in the top left corner. And if you're running an Android application, the, the standard way would be uh, using the back button because Android have has uh, a back button. So this is just one example. So how would you solve this? Probably writing an if in the code. If Android, nothing. If iOS, just one if. Uh, if we had time, I could show a couple more of these ifs that uh, you will have to write uh, in your application. So it quickly degrades the quality of the code. And maybe you're maintaining a code that is very hard to iterate and to test because you were thinking at the first that you were just writing things once. And I, I'm challenging that notion. And was, one last thing about uh, mobile, um, the mobile web. It is very important, uh, but for a very different use case. So if I wanted to buy this beautiful lamp here uh, from scratch, Maybe I'll take my phone and I'll open the application and for, that use, for this use case, maybe the native is the best possible experience. But let's imagine a different situation. I'm having lunch, uh, lunch in my desktop. I see in my big computer screen this lamp and maybe I ask seller a question. We can do that in marketplaces. Then I go out, I'm in red light driving and uh, I'm checking my email and I see that uh, seller answered my question. It's a very strong lead. I will get an email like this. So if I click this, uh, the email client will open a browser, not an application. And converting those leads is very important. So we developed a front end just for mobile. There are there has some HTML5 things. You can swipe, for example. But uh, it's a web page. Uh, so in, the, in order of importance, transactional emails are the very first uh, vehicle for converting other leads in mobile web. Second is Facebook. If you click on a link on Facebook, Facebook will open a browser, not an application. Maybe in iOS 6 it will be possible. But right now, the web is, uh, is really important. And also search. 
So uh, the bad news is uh, maybe you have to do it everything. <laughs> you have to do a great mobile web experience uh, and a great native experience for all platforms. And if you are in Latin America or many, maybe other parts of the world, uh, the declining platforms like such as Symbian or maybe BlackBerry are still very important. So that's about mobile. So the last section, uh, this is maybe now in time, we fast forward uh, almost 12 years until this moment. Uh, so the thing that it's keeping me, one of the things that is keeping me up at night is how to tackle social. Uh, in Latin America, Facebook is huge, and so is Google, and we are experiencing, experiencing sorry, uh, a great deal of traffic from, coming from Google and a small percentage of our traffic coming from Facebook. And this is the case of many e-commerce platforms I know. So we were experimenting in this, because uh, maybe intent is easier to capture than behavior. And that's why maybe search is, uh, is easier as an e-commerce platform to tackle or to solve when you're trying to deliver traffic. If you're searching for something, I'm showing you a relative ad, uh, and you're done. Social is not that easy. So you all know this. Facebook is large. You all know this, uh, probably, that uh, we are influenced by our social circle, uh, maybe in, in the same way uh, we are influenced by the classic advertising. So that, that is very hard to deny. I you cannot say here, but uh, this uh, slide belongs to Paul Adams, uh, uh, an engineer at, at Facebook. So we, we tried to, uh, to exploit this fact that we are in a large community and that friends actually can uh, influence my purchasing behavior. So we are, the first thing we did is the classic stuff, sharing, uh, I mean, I like Rubik's Cube. Maybe my friends are nerds like me, so they will love some of them solving Rubik's Cubes. So if I, I bought a professional cube, maybe sharing this among my friends will have a very different effect than sharing among my wife's friends. You all know this. But then we tried to leverage the, the open graph, the activity feed at Facebook. And I've not seen, I haven't seen that many companies doing that. So in, at Facebook, you can create custom verbs. Are you familiar with custom verbs? So the, the, there are standard verbs like, like, like read, someone read this article. But for example, there is no standard verb right now for someone bought this item. Someone saw this item. So you can create those custom verbs on Facebook and trying to explain Facebook a bit better. Instead of saying, I like this Ruby cube, I can say, I bought this Ruby cube. Uh, and the meaning is different. So uh, you can get very easily into the activity feed uh, section of the page. So you have the, the news feed that is affected by the edge rank algorithm. So not everything is posted on, on the news feed. But almost everything, sorry, everything is posted chronologically in the activity feed. So that's the first thing that uh, is useful to do. And you have to close the loop. In order to reach virality, you need to tackle every single point of sharing, sharing and resharing. Another interesting point to tackle uh, is the timeline integration. Uh, please don't pay attention to the tennis match. Is this, is this part the, the important one? Uh, this is my timeline, so my personal page. So I have like a summary of the items I saw on Mercalibre. Uh, and this is also very powerful, and it's driving traffic. Another point of integration is our own website. So the idea is to feed the loop in every possible contact point. I don't know if you're familiar, but Facebook has this activity feed widget. Are you familiar? Have you ever heard of this? So, 
this is the activity feed on Facebook. So they have a widget that lets you use the same information tailored to your own website. And you can add this widget to your own pages. So if it's the first time that I get into Mercado Libre, and uh, first time, but I am logged in at Facebook, which is the 99.9% .9 of the cases, uh, in, not 99, but a high number of cases in Latin America, I will see familiar faces. I'll see familiar faces and, and I'll see what they've seen on Mercado Libre. This is very powerful because we can aggregate stuff. We can say th those are the most sold items. I don't know if you can read Spanish, but these are, are the most sold items in the last hour. We can do whatever. But if it's the first time, there's not much I can do. But showing familiar faces with related product is very important. And uh, we also have this aggregation, the most shared items in the last hour. So the, the most shared items are very different in essence than the most uh, sold items. Think about it. If, you, if you're buying, I don't know, a, a new memory for your camera, you're not going to share this. It's not very interesting. Uh, but if you bought a Rubik's Cube or a Homer Duck or something that is cool, maybe you will share this. So the most shared items are not the same stuff that the most sold items. So I just showed you an assortment of the, of the contact points that uh, we developed. Uh, and this is a very important concept that, that I learned this concept uh, not, not 10 years ago, not two years ago, less than a year ago. And it's the viral loop. Very important. Very important. If you don't close the loop, so the viral loop is you have stories. On Facebook, story is anything published to Facebook. Story is someone saw this item, like, share, everything is a story. So out of stories, you get clicks. Out of clicks, you get connections. A connection is a connected user, a permission accepted. And uh, out of all those connected users, you have publishers. Some of those connected users will become publishers, guys who publish stuff. So we can measure all these ratios, the clicks per story, the connections per click, the publishers per connections, and the amount of stories on average that they publish. If you combine all this into a product, you get a number, the virality factor. If you break any piece of this change, the virality factor is going to be zero. Exactly. So if this is greater than zero, you will be having a viral solution up there. Then you can tweak it. But uh, if you don't design this to happen, it won't happen. It, it sounds obvious, but for example, this classic solution. You as a seller, you share all your items on Facebook. OK, you got stories. Maybe you will get clicks. But your friends are not sellers. Why would, they, why would your friend in t friends in turn share your listings? They don't want your listings on their Facebook walls. Why? There's no reason. So you broke the virality by definition. This user must be in the same conceptual category. If this is a buyer, when it comes back, should be a buyer, not a seller. <laughs> so there is no way. That's a practical example of, instead of running numbers, it's a practical example of you have to design something to be viral. I learned uh, this uh, not that long ago. So we tried to, to, to exploit virality in, uh, for years. And uh, we achieved a little number of connections, maybe in the range of tens of thousands. And uh, a while ago, not that long ago, when the, this, uh, this blue line is, is marked, uh, we closed the loop for the first time. And I've never seen a curve like this in my life. This is the first time that I've seen an exponential growth curve uh, in my own life. We reached a million users in less than a month. Uh, we're not sure how we're going to exploit these connections. I'm just sure that we found something. Uh, and this is important because this is one of the ways 
that uh, social networks can be actually used. And this is a very powerful asset. I mean, we're driving traffic from it, but the, the asset of all these connected users are maybe more important uh, in the long run than the actual transactions that they are generating. So don't give up. Maybe you'll close the loop at some point too. So wrapping up, we have 15 minutes left. Uh, this experience is uh, for all websites, not just uh, large platforms. I think you would agree that almost everyone can apply these uh, lessons learned. Uh, simple is hard. The creative of, creator of Clojure has a great talk uh, named Simple is Hard. Achieving simplicity is extremely hard, and uh, subtracting is, uh, sorry, harder than adding. <laughs> it's wrong. A-B testing is useless uh, when you're evaluating dramatic changes, so don't, don't get caught in these prove-it uh, traps. HTML5 is the future, but not the present. And native applications deliver, the, deliver right now the best user experience, and you also need the, the mobile web as a landing, probably. Uh, social applications are useless unless they are conceived as viral. Social is not the same as viral. You need to be, uh, them to be viral. And uh, once virality is achieved, uh, the growth could be really exponential. So that's it. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, uh, like 15 minutes for, for Q&A. Uh, so please don't throw your questions. From the innovations that you did, did you notice any unexpected outcomes? A lot of them. Uh, that's a nice question. The, when you decouple, there is an implication when you decouple. You lose control a little bit. Because you are, when you're a monolithic application, you have many performance penalties and maybe flexibility penalties. But you control the thing. You control the beast. You can watch the elephant move this way or this way. When you decouple and when you let many little cells interact with each other, you lose a little bit of control. And you see some unexpected results. And sometimes you build the same thing twice. Sometimes uh, you lose the concept of a, of a whole product because uh, maybe you do something here and this other team just made something which is not compatible to the first one. So. Uh, we did a lot of this, especially in the API buildings. So the, there's a, to the client, it must look as one API, but internally, there are decoupled teams. So we've, we had many of this. If you're asking for this information here, this is not compatible with that there. And uh, we had to fix it as we went by. But uh, I think that this is a fair price to pay for, uh, for the good things that Increase of, increase of the, the increasing of the pace of innovation was, was incredibly high, so we could afford to make mistakes and correct them, as we did. So, so with the viral uh, loop that you're talking about, uh, how did you close the loop? Sorry? How did you close the loop? Oh, that's... Uh, well, in our case, it was clear. Uh, we were trying to... It was just the example I, I gave. We encouraged sellers to share, but when the loop was turning the first lap, the guy there was not a seller, so there, there was no motivation to, to share in turn. So in our case, I'm sure in your case it's gonna be different, uh, but in our case, we'd, we needed to come up with something that uh, every single user in the system as the same status, everyone was buyers. So if I find something interesting, and you're my friend, you will in turn find the same thing interesting. And if you look at this, maybe you will share in turn because we're both finding this stuff interesting. Maybe if we're trying to buy a car, there's a, there's some categories that categories that work better than others. If you're looking for a freezer, viral is not gonna be there. But uh, cars, houses, uh, fashion probably. Uh, cool stuff like uh, collectibles work perfectly well. 
uh, and we wasn't connected users. Uh, we needed to connect to actually connect and share on behalf of the users. Maybe you could catch up later. It's, uh, but that, does it answer the question? Uh, hey. um, uh, for the exponential growth curve and the, the viral question, did you notice you on opening like new markets? Yeah. Like people from different countries or any other like really, uh, analytic anomalies? Sorry, I, I couldn't get to the, the, hear the... Could you please t turn on? When... Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> For that exponential curve, did you notice that you had, like, reached an untapped market? Were yeah. there new countries uh, or, or new users, or many of them? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, well, Facebook has very different penetrations in every market. So the answer is, the short answer is yes. So the, there are some countries that we were large compared to Facebook, such as Brazil. So Facebook has become the, the, the number one social network in Brazil relatively recently. There is another powerful social network in Brazil. So in Brazil, maybe we are, in comparison, larger than Facebook that we are, in, for example, in Argentina or in, in, in Mexico. So in countries like Brazil, uh, Facebook, this social integration is, is doing great. It's, it's growing slowly because Facebook is not that large in Brazil right now. Uh, but it's helping us getting new users. In markets where we have a large user base, uh, Facebook is helping us to convert better. Uh, but in any case, uh, it's a great thing. Uh, we have, we're starting to see this balance between Google and Facebook. Facebook is larger than Google. If you measure time, eyeballs, Facebook is larger than Google in many countries in Latin America. I don't know if in, in the U.S. How is the U.S.? Similar. Mm. But both large. Yeah. I had one question about, it uh, seems like there's a bit of a trade-off between product simplicity yeah. uh, and building everything on top of your API. Uh, you know, you build five products, Maybe one or two are, are hugely successful, you know, a couple live on, and then one gets shut down. So, well, certainly from a product point of view, you can, you know, shut, you can turn on anything you want or shut off whatever you want. Yeah. You know, it yeah. seems like building on top of the ABI, you still have this complexity that sort of lives on, you know, if you're going to keep your developer community happy. Yes. Uh, there, is a, there is definitely a trade-off between, if I understood the question correctly, there is a trade-off between product simplicity and uh, the, the APIs and everything you must build as a common platform, because maybe your APIs are not the right ones to sustain the product you're designing. Is that a question? Yes. Uh, so we see this all the time. Every single front end wants a ch slight change in the APIs. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's say we're writing the search API. Search API could be returning only the IDs of the matching products. It could be an approach. So if I'm a front end, I could take these IDs, query, query all the all other APIs to decorate these IDs and draw my front end. That's one extreme. And another extreme, as an API, I could build, I, I could show you in the results in the, in the first search API, every single data you need to render your page. That's the other extreme. Which one is correct? It's very hard to tell, because if you introduce much complexity in your APIs, if you denormalize a lot, then you can, you, you're hurting the performance of your API, and you're also hurting the simplicity of your API. So the guiding principle that we are using is the following. We pick canonical use cases. For example, for the items API, the, the listings API, it's meant for serving the view item page. This is the canonical page, the, the page when you see only one item. And we try to decorate almost everything to, to be able to render this page only using one API call. But if you're trying to do something else, maybe the checkout process, maybe you have to combine APIs. And if I'm the checkout guy and I'll say, you know, please, I, I, have, I need, more shipping information because I, I, I need to preload stuff, uh, you have to perform an additional API call. Or maybe you will have to 
build an aggregator. Something I, I didn't say, for the basic APIs, like items or users, the, the previous ones, the, the responsibilities of these APIs are very basic. Only the insert and update, that's it. And they use, they have to only comply with this insert, update, and show in one, and to produce a feed. So if you want to aggregate, for example, uh, if you want to build a background, sorry, I'm, I'm extending, but if you're building a, a seller uh, dashboard, for example, for all your items that you're selling at a particular point in time, you have to subscribe to the feed, collect all the news from the items, and build your own search engine. Because the items guys will not do that for you. It sounds weird, but it's the only way of keeping the pace of every single request that we're having. Uh, I don't know if it's a, maybe it's sense, it makes sense if you're actually trying to decouple your teams and doing API, but maybe if, if you're not there, maybe this answer will not be tangible to you. Uh, but you have to make a balance. More on this decoupled services stuff. Um, so, uh, in a world where where um, some of the, lar the 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 most popular pages have, let's say, more than one API that they need to use in order to construct the page, um, and given that in each of the teams, if they are viewed as a startup and have full uh, full control over the language they use, the data store they use, the caching mechanism they use. Um, is is there so, it, it, do, do they also have a responsibility to bubble up the, uh, from a performance standpoint, a page takes X amount of time, is it, is it also their responsibility to bubble up the dirty guts of why, of what percentage is Mongo, is Redis, is Postgres, is React, is, you know, um, is Java, is Perl, is that sort of thing? Uh, <clears throat> they don't have this responsibility, but they are using New Relic. I don't know if you're familiar with, with this tool. But we define very aggressive performance metrics for every single API. And uh, so they can use whatever they want. But it's very hard to do this using whatever they want. So we have like, <laughs> we have like, an, like the standard or normal ways of solving stuff. Redis is one of, uh, of the classical methods of uh, decoupling uh, uh, or scaling the, the reading part. But uh, it usually is like this. For the key APIs, we have very aggressive metrics. So if the updex is not where you want it to be, we sit our engineers with the architects and say, you know, maybe Mongo is a beautiful data store, but maybe you're using something else. Maybe you're in love with PHP and MySQL, but because you know it from your previous job, but you know, we're gonna use something different. So it's not like uh, we have 20 cells and 20 different languages. It's not like this. Uh, it's more like the opposite. You use the standard way, unless you have a very specific point in which you have to use something different. For example, one of the last uh, developments were using uh, Node.js because they proved that uh, the throughput was much better than, than their classical Java solution. That, go ahead. Uh, but it's the, the burden of the proof, uh, it's inverted. Uh, you should use the standard way unless you have a very good point. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, one of the things that, that we have trouble deciding is you know, we have a small development team, we're doing e-commerce, and when do we choose to spend time building new features? You know, oh, we think that you know, if we build this new feature, this recommendation engine, by the end of the quarter, it'll increase cost, whatever, versus flatlining and saying, you know, we really need to work on some of our internal development tools. So in your case, you worked on, on, uh, on developing an API and not really adding any new features, uh, whereas you, you might have added, you know, other features which would have improved, you know, activation rate or, yeah, or yeah, yeah. you know, so how, how do you go about making that decision for when to do one versus, versus another? Yeah, uh, unfortunately there, there's no right answer for that. Uh, the, I can share what we did. The best moment to change is 
one year ahead of the curve. We're doing right. Uh, if you can change without being pushed into change, that's the best moment. Uh, so think about it. We changed when we were a public company, leader, I mean, number one in 13 countries. No one, I mean, there's always tough competition there, but it's not like we were being outpaced by a competitor. It wouldn't be possible to stop everything for a year uh, just at the same time, you're trying to outperform a competitor. So we found this time. At the same time, it's very hard to change when everything is right. Because how do you explain it internally? You know, we are the number one, but we need to change. It's, so for change management, this is not the right moment. It's very easy to have a competitor or, 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 a, or a threat and say you need to change because look at this threat. Uh, so for change management, changing when, when you're doing great uh, is not the best moment, but strategically is the right moment. So we decided that uh, since we were strategically lost and we were doing tactically well, that was the right moment to do this. That was our logic. But don't forget, do you remember this horrible form on the left? We IPO'd with this form. So I don't want to pass the wrong message. We became a, pub, a successful public company with this horrible form. So it's not a life and death situation. It was a strategic life and death situation. So you had to decide. I know how frequently you decide new features, but uh, it has to be d decided probably with the top management saying, there's this tactical decision versus this strategic decisions, strategies out there to say no and to resist temptation. So you have to strike the right balance, but maybe it helps. Any more questions? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, hope you see you there.